What's going on everyone? Today is November 11th, I believe. Yes, it is November 11th. But today we're going to be talking about something that's been nagging at me and I know has been nagging at a lot of you guys too. One of you guys even commented on my last video. You guys said, um, or you said, whatever happened to all of Neo's partnerships for battery swap that they were going to lease the technology out to under the battery swap alliance. And honestly, that's the question. If you've been following Neo, you remember all of those headlines from late 2023 to 2024. Shangan, Gili, Jack, Fall, Cherry, Gak, Lotus, all of these major automakers uh, supposedly partnering with Neo and partnering with Neo to build the world's largest uh, battery swapping ecosystem. William Lee was comparing it to AWS. For those of you who don't know, that's Amazon Web Services. It's the cloud, pl the most popular cloud fl uh, platform that people use for their um, data center application need. The vision was massive, standardized batteries, shared network, economies of scale, the whole thing. But here's the uncomfortable truth as of right now, today, November 2025, zero mass production vehicles have actually hit the market from the battery swap alliance. Not a single one, just silence around this uh, topic, kind of. So today we're asking two big questions. Number one is what the hell happened to the battery swap alliance and where are the cars? Question number two is, is CATL, I'll probably call them cattle throughout the vehicle, the, the world's uh, biggest battery manufacturer, who's also now creating battery swapping stations and creating them very aggressively and pretty fast, um, and who, who is supposed to be Neil's partner, are they trying to eat Neil's lunch? So listen closely because folks, there's a plot twist in this story and it involves 30,000 battery swapping stations, a 2.5 billion rent investment, and the very real possibility that Neil's biggest ally could become their biggest competitor. So buckle up guys, this is Courtside Financial where we keep things objective and yes, we are about to get uncomfortable. Let me take you back to where it all started guys because timelines matter. November November 21st, 2023, Neo and Shangan Automobile signed the first partnership. This is huge. Shangan is one of China's big four state owned manufacturers. November 29th, 2023, Geely Holdings joins. Geely owns Zeker, Lincoln Co., Polestar, Volvo, Lotus. They're massive. January 11th, 2024, both Jack Group and Cherry Automobile signed on the same day. Cherry's killing it in exports, selling cars globally. April 25th, 2024, Lotus, the British sports car brand owned by Geely, officially partners up. May 8th, 2024, Gap Group joins. They manufacture Honda, Toyota, and Mitsubishi domestically, plus their own Ion EV brand that sold over half a million vehicles in 2023. May 22nd, 2024, Fall Group, another state-owned giant, becomes the seventh member. September 2024, Jayu, the Geely Baidu joint venture, becomes the eighth member, though they're now in financial trouble. So by mid-2024, Neo had locked down partnerships with eight major automakers representing millions of vehicle sales annually. William Lee said the development timeline for battery swap enabled vehicles is about 18 months. So do the math. Uh, from late 2023, we should be seeing cars by now, right? Here's what we actually have. In January 2025, Cherry announced that their Exceed brand would launch battery swap compatible models. A sedan and an SUV, those are coming out in Q3 2025. That's July, September. We're now in November. Those cars were supposed to be out. The latest reports say Cherry's Exceed Atlantic's ET and ES models have been tested at Neo swap stations. There are videos of them inside the stations, but no confirmed launch date yet and no deliveries. That's it. That's the entire progress update of the Battery Swap Alliance program, uh, which as we discussed has eight partners in it and began in 2023. So what happened here? Why is nobody launching cars? Well, I do what I do and I went into some really deep research and in doing so, I found some of the things that are going to make Neo Bulls uncomfortable, but we've got to keep it objective here. The first issue is that standardization is hard. Remember, these partnerships uh, promise unified battery standards and joint development. But here's the problem. Every automaker has their own chassis design, their own battery configuration, and their own engineering. Neo currently uses four battery sizes, 70 kilowatt hour, 75 kilowatt hour, 100 kilowatt hour, and 150 kilowatt 
not out. Their stations are designed for those specs. For Shangan, Geely, Jack, and everyone else to build around those, they'll have to either A, redesign their chassis to fit Neo's battery swap station's designs, which is obviously very costly and time consuming. B, develop standardized packs together, which is a coordination nightmare. Or C, build their own swap stations, which defeats the entire purpose of the alliance in the first place. And according to reports, there's been stratification of cooperation levels. At the basic level, some brands like IM Motors are only connected to NEO's charging network, not the swapping network. At the advanced level, there's companies like Cherry who are building battery swappable cars, but they're planning to use their own stations, not NEO stations. At the core level, only Shingon's Shenlon sub-brand is uh, actually planning to share NEO's battery swapping stations so far. That's not an alliance. That seems like loose coordination with everyone kind of protecting their own turf. Number two is the battery as a service di dilemma. I know we're all bullish on battery as a service, but there's something in battery as a service that a lot of people don't ever talk about. A 2025 survey showed that 68% of the people choosing battery as a service, the customers choosing battery as a service, care most about being able to upgrade their battery pack. Not just swapping for convenience, but Neo's battery as a service pricing uh, creates a bit of conflict here. If you're renting a 75 kilowatt hour battery for 728 ren a month but want to upgrade to a 100 kilowatt hour battery, it jumps to 1128 ren uh, per month. That's about a 55% increase in what you're paying. So, from that perspective, there's lots of complaints. Now, granted, you are drastically increasing the battery capacity. Now imagine your Cherry or GAC, you're supposed to adopt Neo's battery as a service model along with their pricing uh, for the model and Neo's asset management system. That's basically outsourcing a lot of critical things to a competitor, the entire energy business of your company to a competitor. And I can see why uh, wearing my objective hat for some that wouldn't be very appealing. And issue number three, Here's the big one. The elephant in the room. On December 18th, 2024, CATL dropped the bomb. They announced standardized battery packs called the number 20 and the number 25 Chaco SEB, swapping electric blocks. Designed to work across multiple brands without requiring unified chassis structures. And so CATL's approach is just modular battery blocks that car makers can configure flexibly. You don't have to adopt someone else's standard. You keep design control. And they launched it with nearly 100 partners. 10 models were announced immediately. Shangan, GAC, BAIC, Wuling, FA, SAIC, all building CATL compatible SWAT vehicles. Here's what a senior exec from a new energy vehicle brand reportedly said. The CATL solution leaves room for us to define battery packs, which is the essential difference between an open and closed system. Translation, Neo system to them feels like a walled garden. CATL uh, to them feels much more freeing and open source. So the uncomfortable answer to what happened to the battery swap alliance is this. Standardization turned out to be way harder than anyone thought. Battery as a service integration uh, creates conflicts of interest. CATL offered an alternative that lets automakers uh, maintain control. And the first non-NEO vehicles from the alliance are 18 plus months delay. That doesn't mean it's dead. Cherry's models are coming eventually, but it's way behind schedule and the momentum has clearly shifted. All right, let's talk about the plot twist because this is where things get really interesting and unfortunately scary for Neo. March 17th, 2025, Neo and CATL announced a strategic partnership. They're gonna build the world's largest battery swap network together. CATL will invest up to 2.5 billion Ren, that's about $346 million in NEO power. It's presented as a win-win. The deal says CATL will support NEO in developing the swap network. CATL's Chaco swap tech will be integrated into future Firefly models. Both networks will operate in parallel. Sounds great, right? Partnership, collaboration, synergy. But then fast forward to November 9th, 2025, literally uh, last week. William Lee is at a NEO owner event in Shangzhou and someone asked about CATL integration and Lee says Firefly will not integrate with CATL's battery swapping network. Wait, what? 
Lee explains that CATL uses air-cooled battery packs targeting the ride-hailing market, while Firefly uses liquid-cooled packs for better safety and temperature performance. Some bloggers noted that Lee might have been talking about the current Firefly EV, not the future model. But the optics are awkward because it directly contradicts the March announcement. Now let's look at what CATL is actually building. 2024 CATL unveils the Chaco Swap ecosystem with nearly 100 partners. 2025 goal 1000 swap stations. Midterm goal 10,000 stations. Long term goal 30,000 stations across China. For context, NEO currently operates 3,562 swap stations after building since 2018. EATL wants to hit 10,000 in just a few years and eventually 30,000. And here's the kicker in April 2025, Reuters reported that CATL was in talks to acquire a controlling stake in NEO power. Neither company confirmed it. NEO said they were working with multiple investors, including CATL, to build the network. But think about what that would mean. If CATL takes control of NEO power, they instantly become the dominant player in the passenger car battery swap. They'd own NEO's 3,500 plus station network, and they'd be building their own Chaco swap stations. That's market dominance overnight. So is CATL a threat? Let me break down both sides. The first side is the NEO is fine case. CATL's investment strengthens NEO power financially. 2.5 billion rand helps NEO to reach profitability. CATL focuses on the ride hailing fleet market, which is um, about being air cooled. NEO focuses on the premium passenger car market liquid cool different customer bases minimal overlap that's what some people will say and the partnership obviously accelerates infrastructure build out for everyone and here's the catl is eating neo's lunch cake catl obviously has some very very deep pockets deeper than neo and can outspend neo on construction catl's open platform approach um seems to be more attractive uh, to other automakers right now than NEO's closed platform approach. GAC Ion just launched their first mainstream passenger car using CATL's Chaco Swap in November 2025. That's this month. CATL plans to expand to Europe, directly competing with NEO International. If CATL acquires NEO Power, then NEO Power becomes a tenant in C CATL's own ecosystem. CATL provides the batteries for NEO's vehicles, so it's a win win for them either way. Here's my take CATL isn't trying to eat NEO's lunch. They're building a bigger restaurant next door. They're not attacking NEO di directly, they're building a more open ecosystem with less barriers to entry, also having faster deployment and more flexibility. Uh, for automakers. And because CATL is the world's largest battery maker and has a 44.3% market share in China, they've got the scale and, cap and capital to definitely um, out deploy NEO. NEO's advantage was being first, uh, building the technology and proving that the model worked. A first mover advantage only matters if you can maintain the lead. And right now CATL is moving faster on partnerships, station deployment, and international expansion with these stations. Okay, so where does this leave NEO? Because we've painted a pretty complex picture. Let's bring this home with what this actually means for NEO and NEO bulls like myself. Battery Swap Alliance, as originally envisioned, was not delivered. That's just a fact. Eight partnerships announced zero production vehicles launched as of now. Cherry's coming in Q3, uh, Q4, but that's one vehicle out of eight. And they're building separate stations. CATL is aggressively com building an alternative that seemingly is attractive to competitors, all because it's open and it's more flexible. Neo just said Firefly won't use CATL's network. And by that, at the very least, they meant at least the current model. That contradicts the March partnership announcement and it creates confusion. But here's the nuance. Neo's not standing still. They're building 1,800 to 2,000 new stations in 2025 through a Power Up Partners program where third parties build the station and Neo rents them. Massively, that reduces CapEx. They're also launching the fifth generation stations by Christmas 2025 that are faster, store more batteries, and support multiple brands, including Envo and Firefly. And on top of that, they're expanding internationally with Firefly using a cheaper, faster station design optimized for Europe, which is only one third of the cost of NEO's current stations. And then they're still maintaining that premium positioning 
with liquid cooled packs, better performance and higher capacity options, 60 plus kilowatt hours is coming for Firefly. And here's something important too guys, Neo doesn't need to win battery swapping to succeed as a company. If the swap alliance grows slowly but steadily and Cherry, Gak and others eventually launch compatible vehicles, that's validation. It reduces Neo's per station cost as scale increases. If CATL builds 10,000 stations targeting ride hailing in lower tier cities, that's not necessarily competition. It's expanding the total addressable market and normalizing battery swap as a concept. And if Neo achieves Q4 profitability, which William Lee reaffirmed and has continued to do so over these uh, weeks, then the battery swap business becomes a strategic moat rather than a cash drain. The CATL threat is real, but it's not existential. It's a competitive pressure and competition makes everyone better. So my synthesis is that the battery swap alliance didn't fail. It just revealed that building industry-wide infrastructure is way harder than anyone anticipated. Standardization requires compromise and automakers hate compromise. The ATL saw the opportunity to build an alternative model that is more flexible and obviously with the resources they have faster to deploy. They're not using it to destroy Neo, they're trying to dominate the broader market. Here's the thing though, if battery swapping becomes the main energy solution in China, whether it's through CATL's network or whether it's through Neo's network or both, Neo win. Their vehicles become more attractive as ba if battery as a service works better and their first mover advantage in technology and user experience compound. But if Neo tries to own the battery swap market and fight CATL for control, they'll burn cash and lose focus on what actually matters. Alright guys, so that was it for this deep dive this episode, this Tuesday episode. If you like this content, make sure you hit the like button and leave us a uh, hit the subscribe button, leave a comment down below, click the notification bell icon, share the video if you found it valuable, insightful, um, or, or at the very least entertaining. Those things really do go a long way in helping out the channel, helping us to reach more people. Happy Tuesday evening. I'll see you guys in the next uh, episode, the next installment. This is Obi with the CF Podcast. Goodbye.